I'm Dr. Carrie Horn, and I am the author of A Soul Aligned, How God Heals His Creations, and the Heart Known Series workbook that is used in conjunction with A Soul Aligned and is a practical application workbook for biblical healing. In this video, I'm going to be talking with you similarly to the way that I talk with people when I first begin to work with them regarding the structure of the soul and why it is that I um, work the way that I work, why it is that a soul aligned is laid out the way that it is. Um, so I'm going to begin talking with you about being a soul. So the word soul gets thrown around quite a bit and um, quite a bit in uh, the occult as well and uh, pagan culture. And a lot of the time, uh, the way in which they're describing a soul is very vague, or they might say mind, body, spirit. Invariably, they leave out the most important part of the soul to Christ, who is our creator, they leave out the heart. So we were designed as a mind, body, heart, and spirit. That is our soul. And we're told in Genesis that when God created us, formed us from the dust, and then breathed into us, we became a living soul. We became a mind, body, heart, and spirit. And that spirit is going to return to God. That spirit, none of us belongs to us, but that spirit belongs to God. When we become a new creation, we are given a new heart. So the heart of stone that's inside of us that became hardened and defiled by the world and the flesh is removed and we are given a heart of flesh, not, not the flesh in the sense of sinful flesh. We're given a softened heart and a new spirit and we are given God's spirit, his Holy Spirit, which is placed in our heart. And then we're told in John 4, 22 through 24, when Christ is speaking with the Samaritan woman at the well, he tells her that the father desires true worshipers who worship in the heart, excuse me, who worship in truth in his word and in spirit. God is spirit. So he says, God is spirit. This is the way that true worshipers, and he uses the word must, must worship in spirit and in truth. Why is all of this important? The part of the reason why this is important is because the world and its disciplines require us to heal in the flesh. We go to a, a, um, a medical doctor and they're treating our body we seek out help for quote unquote mental health and we are treated again in the flesh, in our carnality. And we're told constantly by the world that the way that we heal, the way that we acquire beauty even is from the flesh, is via the flesh. And it's simply not true. We know from the word that illness has a spiritual etiology. The remedy is always the same. God says repeatedly in the Bible, return to me and I will return to you. Rend your heart, not your flesh. He tells us to be circumcised from our sinful flesh, disciplined in our physical flesh, and to return to him where? in the place where he desires true worshipers. Rend your heart to me. Uh, communicate with me in spirit and in truth. Worship me in spirit and in truth. So when Christ was here, he was constantly talking about the heart. And this is because God is spirit. God communicates with our spirit. And he convicts us within our heart. He does not speak to our flesh. He would not tell us to be 
circumcised from our sinful flesh and disciplined in our physical flesh if he was then going to minister to us in the flesh. That is the place that Satan is able to tempt us and is able to confuse and deceive us. So if we're living in the heart and spirit, we will not be deceived. So God designed and created us as a mind, body, heart, and spirit. This is our soul, is our mind, body, heart, and spirit. And even though we are temporarily in this physical flesh, during the resur- those of us who participate in the resurrection, the first resurrection, we will receive, we will continue in the heart and spirit that God gave us during during rebirth, but we will receive a new body and it will be a glorified body. So we will become as the angels is what we're told. I believe that's in Romans. You can, you can Google that. (laughs) I don't have the reference readily available, but we will become as the angels. We will receive a glorified body and our mind is, will become will have become transformed excuse me we will become transformed by the renewing of our minds so this is all part of the rebirth rebirth process and the continual ministry of god's spirit in our in our souls and in our lives now the word mind within that context is the greek word cardia K-A-R-D-I-A. Cardia is most associated, is, is not separate. So in English and in Western culture, we tend to think of mind, body, heart, and spirit as separate, if, you know, if we even consider the heart, right? We tend to think of those as being separate. But cardia, the mind, this, this concept of mind is a mind that is most associated with the, with the heart, it's associated with the soul. It's associated with creativity, you know, some other things that are associated with it, but most associated with the heart. So we have to understand that God's heart, excuse me, God's spirit is placed in our hearts and that we are trans being transformed by that spirit in our hearts. And he is transforming our souls When we are conformed to God, we become God-like. We become like him in his image. We were were made in his image, but we we are continuing in his image and being transformed in his image. When we are conformed in the flesh or to the world, we are defaulting to becoming in the image of the devil, That is the spirit to whom we are conformed, and that is the spirit to whom we will be transformed. Now, the soul, mind, body, heart, and spirit, those components of the soul, while they are integrated, they are not all equal. They are not all equal in authority. In our three-person God, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who are all equal in value, but they are not equal in authority. The Father submits, excuse me, the Son submits to the Father, and the Holy Spirit also submits to Christ as Christ submits to the Father. And we're told in John that he's not going to, that the he, this, the Holy Spirit is not going to act on his own authority. He's going to, he will receive everything from Christ. Just as Christ, when he was here, said, I don't speak, this is not my own teaching. And I don't act on my own authority. I do what I see the Father doing. So we can agree that they are not equal in authority, but they are equal in value. And that is God. All three are God and integrated. 
Similarly, our soul is not equal. These components of our soul are not equal in authority. The mind and body in which we are living must be submitted to the heart and spirit as the heart and spirit are submitted to the Holy Spirit in our heart who communicates with our spirit. If our bodies and our minds are running the show, we are conformed in the opposite direction. If we are ignoring the heart and spirit, which we would be doing if we are <clears throat> prioritizing the mind and body, our, car our carnal, um, the, the flesh that we are living in, then we are conforming to the world, the sinful flesh, and defaulting to conformity to Satan. We're attempting to be what the world calls a self. We're not a self apart from God. We don't actually have a self that exists apart from the one who created us because the one who created us created us to be a vessel for his spirit. And so if we're not a vessel for his spirit, we're still a vessel and we will be a vessel for another spirit. But he is the one who created us You and the creation cannot separate from the creator. A creation does not then become inhabited by itself if it was designed and created to be a vessel. We cannot inhabit ourselves. So if we reject the one who has created us to be to inhabit us, we will be inhabited by a different spirit, not self. So in order for us to heal, we have to understand how we have been created and designed and what the intention of our creator has been. His intention is always to help us to understand our covenant and to cause us, to move us to obey that covenant. And so you can see very clearly in this design of the soul, if we choose to reject his teaching and command to be circumcised from the flesh, which by the way, represented our covenant. That's what he told Abraham, that circumcision represented our covenant. Why did it represent our covenant? Because when we are circumcised from the sinful flesh and we are disciplined in our physical flesh, what is disciplining? What is circumcising? It's the spirit of God. We make the decision and we do the work that is within our capacity, which means getting into the heart and spirit where God is. And so this is representing the choice that we are making to be conformed to God, to obey him, to be disciplined according to his spirit, to conform to him, to receive him, to live as he would have us live. Our mind and body, therefore, are absolutely part of our design that was intentional by our creator. But we also have this sinful flesh, which our creator also created. And he tells us that he, he's the one who created these things. He created the light and he created the darkness. And he wants us to choose whom we will serve. And this is the way that we choose whom we will serve. Are we living in the heart and spirit or are we living in the flesh? If we're living in the flesh, there is no way for us to be in him. There is no way for us to hear him. There's no way for us to obey him because we know that the flesh fights against the spirit of God. So we need a way in which to be disciplined and a way in which to conform in the correct direction. So if you're looking at the, 
at the entirety of the soul, mind, body, heart, and spirit, we want the arrow to go towards the heart. So the center, the core of the soul is the heart and spirit. And God is in our hearts when we are made a new creation. When we are given the Holy Spirit, he's in our hearts. And by the way, I don't know if I mentioned, but that is Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. So he is in our hearts. So that is the direction in which our soul needs to conform. Christ did not come here saying, I'm a self and God gave me this authority to go run on whatever it is that I want to do. And he gave me this power to misuse. The power in him was the spirit of God. Having been made flesh, the spirit of God in him was the power. And so if he separated from that, he would have separated from the power. He would have separated from the ability to even have wisdom or knowledge or understanding. And so similarly, we are told that if we separate from the vine, who is Christ, then we as branches, if a branch separates from the vine, it's going to lose its its life source. And it will wither and die And Christ tells us that those branches that wither and die, they dry up and they're thrown in the fire. So he set this example for us of how to be conformed and submitted. So the mind and body, the sinful flesh is absolutely useless. There's no use for the sinful flesh. That is why we're told to be circumcised, completely cut off from it. But the physical flesh does have use. It's the means by which I'm speaking to you. I'm using my physical flesh. But my physical flesh has to be disciplined. And how is my physical flesh disciplined? It can't discipline itself. It can only be disciplined by my choice and subsequent action and posture of submission to God. And so as my mind and body submit to my heart and spirit, as my heart and spirit are submitted to God, my flesh becomes disciplined. That is my role in the covenant that I've made with Christ. is to live in my heart and spirit, to prioritize my heart and spirit as being the most important part of my soul because my heart and spirit are the only place that I can communicate and worship God as he truly desires. My heart and spirit do not fight against God because God is in my heart. And really the spirit that he placed in me will, I'm told, will return to him. That's his spirit. So Christ did not say that the heart and spirit fight against the spirit of God. He said the flesh fights against the spirit of God. This is the nature of the soul. And so I think from this teaching, you could probably understand or consider for a moment, why is it that the occult or the world, pagan culture, why is it that they focus on mind, body, heart, uh, mind, body, and spirit, and they always leave out the heart? Why would they leave out the heart? Because the heart is the very place that 
God places his spirit. And once we understand that, then this then it actually makes sense how the soul works together. But think for a moment, what has been the teaching that or or the the understanding that you've had of the relationship between mind, body, and spirit as the world talks about it? Very vague, very um well, what I'm talking about is abstract. But just because something is abstract doesn't mean it's not clear. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit won't make it clear. But from my personal experience, listening to people talk about mind, body, spirit has never really, there's never really been clarity around that. It's always been something vague that the so-called expert is the only one in the room who seems to know what the heck they're talking about. But it's very clear how the mind, body, heart, and spirit interact because Christ made it clear and because his Holy Spirit makes it clear when we're speaking in truth. So this is the nature of the soul. This is what the soul actually is comprised of according to the one who created us. Mind, body, heart, and spirit. We are to worship God in spirit and in truth, because these are the worshipers that the Father desires. True worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. That's John 4, 22 through 24. When we are made a new creation, God gives us a new heart and a new spirit, and he places his spirit in our hearts and moves us to follow his laws, and keep his decrees. That's Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. He tells us to circumcise from our sinful flesh. Our sinful flesh is our will. And all of the sinful desires that we have, our desires for self, which in this current world, that isn't a bad thing. It's become a good thing to search for self. It's become a good thing to leave a family or a relationship to go search for ourself. That's become health. That's become maturity. Good has become evil and evil has become good. But we're not a self. So those desires for self are evil. That's part of our sinful flesh. And we are told to be circumcised from our sinful flesh, completely cut off. But then God also talks about being disciplined in our flesh. So we have to be able to reconcile that teaching. How could we be disciplined in a place that we are totally cut off from. He must be talking about a different flesh, and he is. He's talking about the physical flesh that he gave us to live in, the mind and the body. And we know that this includes the mind because he rebukes this carnality of intellectualization, of being wise in our own eyes. He rebukes that throughout the Bible, right? the work of our own hands, the work of our own ideas. So we are living in physical flesh. We've been given a brain, and yes, we should use our brains, but only as they are conformed to God, only as they are conformed in the correct direction and submitted to the heart and spirit as the heart and spirit are submitted to God or are conformed to God or are aligned to God. Now, I want to talk about this word alignment that I use in the title of the book, A Soul Aligned. Um, that was a title actually that was that God spoke to me uh, at the very beginning of this healing journey when he first began talking to me about writing a book. And once I published the book and, and Googled the book, I realized that there is a lot of occult language 
um, that uses uh, occult um, ideas that use this language of soul alignment, alignment. And I took this up with God because I was really upset about it. And I, I wanted to know, was I deceived on that title? Because I prayed about that quite a bit. I prayed about the entire book quite a bit. And the answer that I received is that soul, that the occult has twisted God's language. That's God's language. He used that language first. He said in Genesis at the very beginning that he made man a soul. And he talks repeatedly about conformity in the Bible, conforming ourselves to him, right? In Romans, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be conform to God. And he was demonstrating and illustrating what this looked like from the very beginning when he gave, when he extended this covenant to Abraham and told him to circumcise himself and um, his slaves. He was telling him, you are to be totally cut off from the world. My people must be totally circumcised. It wasn't intended to be that the covenant was about physical circumcision. It was to help us to understand the circumcision of the heart from the world. Because we are not to be conformed to the world we are supposed to be conformed to God. And so the only way that we can experience this completeness, this wholeness, this, uh, this um, fulfillment is in being aligned with the one who created us to inhabit us so that we might be complete in him. That is soul alignment. I don't I have not even bothered to research what the occult has to say about that because I don't care and because it it thoroughly grieves and disgusts me. But I want you to understand very clearly that what I am talking about when I refer to soul alignment, I am talking about aligning ourselves, conforming ourselves, being filled by being uh, uh, prioritizing conformity to God. That is what true soul alignment is. To be aligned with the one who created us. So I don't want you to be mistaken if you've heard other concepts about energy and all of this abstract, vague garbage that comes from the world. That is not what we're talking about ever. It will never be what we're talking about. And we will never be talking about finding yourself or bringing together aspects of yourself so that you are complete within yourself because that also is garbage. It's not true. Yourself only exists in connection with the one who created you to be connected with, to him. Now, I want to bring this together so that you can understand why is it important, and you probably have some ideas about why it is important for us to understand our design in order for us to heal. So think about that for a moment. And, you know, if you need time to think, pause the video. Why might it be important to our healing for us to understand how our creator designed us. He desires worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. He gave us a new heart and a new spirit and he placed his spirit in our heart. Why didn't he place his spirit in our physical flesh or in our brains? If our brains as the world tells us, is the powerhouse. It's the, there's so much power in the mind-body connection. There's so much power in our brains to control things. There's so much power in self-sufficiency and hustle culture. It's a lie. We've been deceived. 
by that, by these teachings in the world. And it's been going on for a long time because God was rebuking his people trying to accomplish things by the work of their hands. He repeatedly told them, I bless you for obedience and I punish you for disobedience. Your idols that you make with your hands are nothing. They can do nothing. They can't even speak. They have to be moved by your own hands, right? A wooden idol or a gold idol. They have to be moved around. They have no legs. They can't speak. You make an idol out of wood and then you use the rest of the wood that you use to make this God and you throw it in the fire to warm yourself or bake some bread, not even realizing how ironic that is. God speaks about healing synonymously with salvation. They're synonymous. Salvation is our healing. Those of us who are so focused on healing a particular aspect of our physical health or our mental health or whatever, there is no amount of idolatry of science or the work of our hands or so-called experts. There's no amount of that that is going to account or is going to um, come against God's will. God will either heal us or he won't in terms of those things. But our he- the healing that we're supposed to be seeking is our salvation, is eternal healing, not healing in the moment. God might be using that affliction. He sent it because he says he sends all these things. I believe that's Isaiah 45, 17. He is the Lord. He sends all these things and he sends it for his purpose because he knows what is good. Every single thing that God has commanded right down to the design that he gave us as a soul has to do with our covenant for salvation. We have not been saved. We have not been saved or we would not continue to be here. We will be saved on the day of the Lord. We are being saved. We have to be able to reconcile those scriptures we are being saved. Paul put himself in that, in that um, category, saying that we are being saved. We're being saved through the covenant that we have with Christ. The first covenant was an if-then covenant. If you obey, then you will be saved. The second covenant, same thing. It is an if-then covenant. And if you want to know about that, then look through the Bible where Christ says, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say, I came here to do for you what you are supposed to do in this covenant. And he said it was difficult for people to get into heaven. And he said that it was that that many were called, but few were chosen. So why would he use that language if we've already been saved? No, we have a covenant And everything that he has done in our design and commanded is to teach us that covenant and to teach us his heart and what is required of us. That is what this has to do with healing. We have to understand our design and we have to understand the heart of God if we are to be healed, if we are to be saved on the day of the Lord, if we are to fulfill the covenant that he has extended to us, which is an if-then covenant. It's not by the works of our hands. It's not by the physical sacrifices that are, that are made. It is by us becoming a sacrifice. It is by us rending our hearts to him. It is by us returning to him. It is by us receiving his ministry That is the only way that we can please God. He doesn't need anything from us. He desires our hearts. That's the work that we do. And remember that in John, Christ had had just fed the multitude, right? He had just fed the multitude manna from heaven. He fed them bread from heaven. And right after, and then he left 
and they, they went looking for him and he said, you're, you know, really you're looking for me because I fed you and you had your fill. Don't search for bread that spoils. Pursue the spiritual bread, right? The bread that leads to eternal life, the teachings, the ministry of God that we're supposed to be asking for every day, give us our daily bread. And we're supposed to be sitting and listening for that and receiving it and hungering for it. Just as David says, like the deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you, dear Lord, right? We're supposed to be craving spiritual bread and spiritual water from God that sustains us, that nourishes us, that leads to eternal life. And the very next thing that they said to him after he fed them, after he fed the multitude, is, well, our ancestors were given bread, manna from heaven. What are you going to do to show us? <laughs> what, what works will you do? He had just done that very work. He had just fed them manna from heaven, and they didn't get it. And then they said, what are the works that God requires of us? What does he want us to do? And Christ said, he wants you to believe in the one he sent. This is, the, this is what God wants from you. He wants you to believe in the one he sent. So yes, while Christ fulfilled the law, and we no longer offer physical sacrifices, animal sacrifices, grain, things like this. We offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. We believe in the one he sent. And if we believe in the one he sent, we will believe in the teachings that he, the one he sent brought. And we'll continue to receive those teachings as he ministers, as he instructs the Holy Spirit to minister to us. That is our covenant. That is why the soul and the design of the soul should matter to us. And I really hope that this video has helped you to understand how these things come together, how these teachings come together, how our design comes together. And I hope that that will help you to understand what God's intention for healing is. He is not concerned with the things that we are concerned about. If we have a short life, if we die physically, that is not the concern of God. His concern is our eternal life. And so he will afflict us according to what he knows is good for us. I shared with you in a soul aligned that I was on the brink of death. I was dying. My daughter and I were grieving already my impending death. My will was in place by the time I was 40 years old. And that was probably, that was the best thing that could have happened for me because God knew what was needed for this knucklehead to crave him. And to finally slow down because I wouldn't slow down. As long as I had the ability to continue moving, I was continuing to move. I would not sit still. And if we can't sit still, we can't hear him. If we can't get still in our heart and spirit, we won't hear him. I was constantly living in my physical flesh. And when we live in our physical flesh, we inevitably live in our sinful flesh. We can't be circumcised from our sinful flesh because our physical flesh has to be conformed to something. So I hope that this has encouraged you to think about the afflictions that God has sent in your life in a different kind of way and to attempt to understand God's heart any time that we are reading scripture, any time that we are considering his commands or the, the things that he has had us doing, such as, you know, Old Testament rituals and things like that, we always want to understand 
what was God's heart in this? Why did he command this? If we love him, if we love each other, if someone you love asks you to do something that doesn't quite make sense, you're going to ask them, why is that important to you? Or you're at least going to wonder about it. And that's how we need to be with God. If we love him and we, ca- and we care about his heart and what's important to him, then we will ask him and we will seek him and we will seek his heart. That's what he desires from us. And then we will have wisdom. We're told that if, if we lack wisdom in any area, that we should ask God and he will give it to us. So I hope that this video has been helpful in terms of giving you clarity and understanding um, and also encouraging you to see things in with a God perspective and to really search, um, seek his heart, particularly with regard to his covenant and our requirements in that covenant. Thank you so much for listening and God bless you.